Ciao. Welcome to Celebrating Culture. Coming to you from the Italian Piazza in New Orleans, Louisiana. The Piazza puts on a great opera every summer. In this episode, we're going to showcase Italian festivals. These festivals showcase the best of being Italian. We're going to interview the people involved and find out what makes each festival special. Ciao, my name is Courtney Tanner. I'm the Secretary of the American Italian Federation of the Southeast, and I want to invite you to our Louisiana Italian Food, Wine, Author, and Film Festival. The Federation is the umbrella organization for Italian American clubs across the South. As Secretary of both the Federation and Young Italian Professionals, I focus on growing the membership of the Italian American future leaders and help our college student applicants apply for scholarship trips to Italy via NEAP's Voyage of Discovery program. This year, the Federation received three out of 40 spots on this trip. As a Voyage of Discovery alum, I can tell you it is a great experience for learning about Italian American heritage and making national connections that will last a lifetime. I look forward to meeting you at the film festival. For more information, please visit our website at AIFEDSE.org. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're coming to you from the American Italian Cultural Center, which is next to the Piazza. And I'm with Frank Maselli, who's the chairman. Frank, welcome to the show. Charles, always a pleasure. So Frank, tell me, we're here at this new exhibit you have for festivals. Tell me about the Opera Festival. That's just one of the events that we've been putting on here for over the last 10 years. About 10 years ago, I was in Rome. I was at the Piazza Navona. So in the center, on a Saturday night, there was a stage and there were a number of opera singers and it was fabulous. The uh, Piazza was full of people and they were singing. And so I said, we need to do this in the Piazza d'Italia back at home in New Orleans. So it took me a few years Finally, I befriended Todd Simmons from the New Orleans Opera Association. He helped me put it together. He arranged the music, Opera in the Piazza. And I'm with Todd Simmons, who's the executive director of the JPAS. Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So, Todd, you have been performing at the opera that we do every summer for many years. Tell us many about years. it. Many years. came out of Frank's idea to put on a show here in the Piazza. Frank, of course, with his father and himself as well, have a huge, long history with the opera. And at the time, I was the executive director at the opera here in New Orleans. It just grew from there, and we started putting on this show every summer, and we were also doing some in Christmas as well. How many performers will be on stage? There will be four singers, and then there's going to be three instruments, two violins and a cellist two hours of programming where the first hour is all your top hits of opera and the second half which is all Broadway hits. And a crowd response, how's that been? Well, that's been incredible. They just love it. you do much outdoor opera? Actually, no, because opera singers don't necessarily enjoy singing outside because their voice is an acoustic instrument and it needs a building to be in. When you do the outside events, you're using microphones and you're doing a different kind of event. I mean, this is not a full-blown opera. These are like the gems of the operas. And so the people who come to these get to really hear your top 10 hits. And it also is a great opportunity for people who aren't accustomed to opera to come and get good tastes of it. So they get to really experience what the best parts of it are. And I've talked to many people that fall in love with it just from this kind of an event. What do you think of the venue? I mean, if anybody hasn't been down here, it is just beautiful. The sound is wonderful. The quality is great. And it's just incredible to sit here in this open space, with, particularly now that it's been renovated. It's just even more incredible. And if somebody wants to find you by a website, jpas.org. You have food as well. You have vendors. We have Verino sausage, which is really terrific Italian sausage. And Norjo's is bringing muffalettas. In the Ferraris. One year we had six Ferraris. It was fantastic. One year you had Sophia Parigi. Sophia's going to come back this year. She'll, she'll be doing some singing in the first hour. Her grandfather was a famous singer in Italy. And you've actually had other events as well. Well, well let's go way back. My dad and all his cronies who started all this back in the late 70s and early 80s, they put on a beautiful Festa d'Italia for about 11 or 12 years. At the end, we were getting 40,000 people visiting the festival. That's how good it was. But you brought that back with this taste of Italy that you had all these great chefs right. where you could yeah. sample, you had great wines. I mean, we, it really celebrated Italian products. Right. And it came out really, really nice. We had like 20 restaurants serving Italian dishes. We had music, the big success. You 
know, about 12 years ago when my dad passed away, I tried to figure out what we were going to do here with this beautiful cultural center. It had been built and renovated back in the early 80s, so it was time in 2009-10 for an update. Well, then over the last four or five years, we've renovated the entire place, created a beautiful jazz exhibit. We created a beautiful event space on the second floor. And then on the third floor is our new museum, totally redone. Our old museum was an artifact museum, so it was just items to look at. This is a narrative museum. It tells a story of the Italian Sicilian immigrants coming here, why they left, what they faced when they got here, the trials and tribulations, and where we are today. You're doing so much here at the Piazza. If somebody wants to know more, is there a website? Our website is the AmericanItalianCulturalCenter.com. Great, I wanna tell you, I just love what you've done, the energy you've brought back. I know your dad would be very proud of what's going on here. The legacy has continued and it's just done so much to be the hub for the Italian community. There's so much to do and enjoy being Italian, or if you're not, enjoy what Italians bring to America. Stay tuned, we'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Ciao a tutti, and greetings from Italy. My name is Patrick Ross Campisi, and I'm the first vice president of the American Italian Federation of the Southeast, as well as the president of the San Expedite Lodge of the Order ISDA. And I'd like to invite you to join us at our Louisiana Italian Author Wine Food and Film Festival. As the first vice president of the Federation, I work to bring together Italian American organizations within the Southeast. And as president of the San Expedite Lodge, our goal is to connect younger generations of Italian Americans and reinvigorate them with pride in being Italian. I look forward to meeting you all at the film festival. To learn more, please visit AIFEDSE.org. Hi, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Culture. Awe News has interviewed hundreds of people and produced dozens of episodes for local broadcasting. Awesome people doing great things to inspire us all. If you'd like to watch a specific interview, please visit our YouTube channel and subscribe. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. I'm here today with Mark Superville, who is the founder of the Muffalata Festival in New Orleans. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate it, man. This is great. So you've started the Muffalata Festival, but before we go there, the history of the Muffalata, so people understand this big piece of bread. This uh, hubcap-sized piece of bread is one of the um, uh, kind of oldest and historic, I guess, foods in New Orleans. And this is one of those original food items here in the city. Mark, there's a lot of stories and controversy in the Italian community on the origin of the Muffalata. In fact, one of my good friends says that his great uncle married a lady named Rosalie Muffalata, who was making the bread, and that's it was called the Muffalata. And then when she married into the Lanassa family, the name Muffalata disappeared. But I understand you have a story about the Ruffino family. It started in like 1890 with the Ruffino family that made the, the, the Muffalata. Now the Muffalata is the bread, not necessarily the sandwich. Decatur Street, that was yeah. Little Palermo. Right. And you see a lot of signs that say the original Muffalata. That's right. And I'm, I'm glad that people do sort of claim the history of the sandwich, because if not, it could have just gone away like a lot of other things in New Orleans has done over the years. Now you've actually got also the mini muffaladas. When people come in and they buy a tray of mini muffaladas, it's like, you know, where, where are you going? Well, it's going to my grandma's house. It's my grandma's 90th birthday, you know. Or, sure. Where are these going? Well, these are going to the game, or these are going to, and the amount of them that actually travel outside the state are pretty amazing as well. You took a business that was going on, you've, yeah. you've expanded it, brought it back, so you have a lot more at the store. If somebody is looking for those Italian commodities, right. they can come here and get a lot of specialty goods. Yes, the store has been around for about 27 years, and it was the continuation of the traditional Italian grocery stores that were all over New Orleans back in the early 1900s. And I think that they defined a lot of the New Orleans neighborhoods. And we still get it today when people come in and they say, my grandparents had a grocery store just like this. Where was it? It was on the corner of. That's what I think this store represents. And that's one of the reasons why I bought it and want to keep it going is that it represents sort of the effort of those immigrants and all immigrants that came to the United States that put up a business, or started a business, right, right, right. and made it work and got their families through life and through school and everything else. 
your right. Muffalata Festival. And you've taken it, you started in uh, 2017. In 2018, you expanded it. So what we're trying to do with the festival is, it is centered around the Muffalata, but that's very symbolic of the food heritage in New Orleans. And that's, that's kind of the purpose of it. Being able to have people explore a food product like breaking a wheel of cheese, that's exciting because we're not only just tasting cheese and eating cheese, we're breaking open a wheel of cheese that's been cured for a very long period of time. When people experience that, they don't forget it and they appreciate food products sure. more, you know? You had the entertainment, you had the yeah. gift shops, you had Italian yeah. desserts, right, yeah. Ferraris. Yeah, the Ferraris. And, and you're next to the train tracks. I think that adds ambiance. There were a few trains yeah. that passed. You have the Bocce Club of Metairie yeah. puts on a display yeah. here. Last year we came to the festival, being the first, we had to come, and we had our grandson with us. He fell in love with bocce ball. He conned his granddad into making a bocce ball set for him at our house in Picayune. So when we told him we were coming to the Muffalata Festival, he says, oh good, bocce ball. Here we are again. Chase enjoying bocce at the Muffalata Festival. <laughs> I am an owner of Lozano's Glass House. We are a mom and pop and daughter shop. I am the daughter. We do traditional stained glass and we do fused glass. So everything that I bring out to the festivals is fused glass. So we do all different food ornaments. So we do muffaladas, we've done pizza, Italian ice snowballs, spaghetti and meatballs, po'boys, king cakes, red beans and rice, Cubics pies, coffee and beignets and snowballs. There's a lot of culture besides just the food. It's, it's, it's an environment, it's a feeling. You know, people tell me when they come in the store, it's like, you know, it feels different in here. It really does. It it's, does. Uh, it's this intangible that you really can't get anywhere, I think, you know? And that's what we're trying to promote as well with the festival and with the store. It's a great place to come if you don't have time to get to downtown New yeah, Orleans right. and you want to get some Italian food. It's a little bit slower paced out here than the French Quarter is. And I think it just gives people time to sort of be together. Um, the patio is always available for people to sit on and they have a good time out here. If someone wants to find you guys, you yeah. got a website? Absolutely, it's Norjo, that's N-O-R-J-O-E dot com. Um, and you can always call the store, it's uh, 504. 833-9240. And of course, Facebook, Instagram, we're, we're everywhere. Mark, thanks for Charles, being on this you, show, man. and thank this you for what you're doing for Absolutely. the Italian community. Absolutely, enjoying it. All right, stay tuned, we'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Ciao, my name is Lisa Ingram, but my heritage name is Tizzolata. I am a vice president of the American Italian Federation of the Southeast. The Federation is the umbrella organization for Italian American clubs across the South. As vice president of activities, I work to help promote the festivals and events of our member organizations. I want to invite you to our Louisiana Italian food, wine, author, and film festival. I love meeting you, sharing our heritage, and knowing the celebrations of your organization. Let's come together as an Italian community and support each other. If you are searching for Italian heritage and want to be added to our efforts, visit our website, aifedse.org. Celebrating Culture is brought to you by Awe News. Awe News also produces New Orleans Insider Tours, which are 10 self-guided tours of New Orleans and Louisiana. To download the apps, all you have to do is point your phone at the flow code in the camera mode, and you're ready to really experience Louisiana. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're here at the Bocce Club in Metairie, Louisiana, and I'm with TJ Stradinova. TJ, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very good. much. Now understand, you're in the middle of a match and you're in the finals. Yes, yeah, so, so you came on a good day. This is our uh, finals for our, uh, our summer leagues. What is bocce? Because a lot of people, it, it's, it's basically pretty simple. Absolutely, so we have actually people in our leagues from uh, 14 years old to 84. So we have all ages, all genders of course, all skill levels. It's a real simple game, so anyone can really pick it up and be decent, but then it takes a lifetime to really be an expert. 
Regarding the game itself, very simple game. It's actually the oldest game known to man. They found frescoes in Egypt dating back to 5200 BC. BC. BC of the Egyptians playing a game very similar to bocce. It is actually associated with Italians these days. And the reason why that happened was when the Roman Empire expanded into Egypt, the Roman legionnaires loved the game so much that they adopted the game. They actually made a bocce set part of their regular equipment along with their spears and their shields. And they took it all around the empire and stayed what you'd be considered an Italian game. However, it's uh, played all over the world these days. A lot of people say it's about the third uh, most played game in the world behind soccer and golf. Very simple game. So you have the small ball, the polino. Then you have the big balls called the bocce balls. And you're basically just trying to get the team's bocce balls closer to the polino than the rest of the other team. Very easy game to pick up. And pretty much anyone can just play at a good skill level within a day. Yeah, we've been around for 47 years now. So we started in the backyards of a couple of members where they created these courts, created these leagues back in 1971. The club itself hosts a lot of other events. You had Republic Day events here? Yes, absolutely. We also have a full kitchen, a bar. We have seating for up to 100 people. Yeah, besides trying to make some money for the club and help out the other Italian organizations by doing more and more events here. We are here back in June to celebrate Italian Republic Day, which was a great event. We actually partnered with Lena Prima's uh, organization, Chow right Women. Now, yes. uh, you know, they came in. We had help from the <laughs> East Jefferson uh, Italian American Society, and we, it was a really good uh, dinner, a great celebration of Italian heritage, and we of course played some bocce. But well, you had some great food. What did you have here? Yeah, we, we've had some some wonderful sponsorships. We've had Angelo Bacato has been a, a wonderful sponsor of ours. You've had Reginelli's. We've had Piccolito Gelato. Also Norjo's. You have Italian classes here? You're yes, working with the Piazza? We have a lot of partnerships with various organizations. One of them that we partner with is the American Italian Cultural Center that's located right near the Piazza d'Italia. They come here on two nights a week and they hold their Italian classes. We're trying to keep this very unique organization alive. We're the only bocce place in town and we've been here for 47 years. If something like this ceases to exist, nothing like this is ever gonna be here again. I mean, this is a unique organization, a unique center, celebrating not only bocce, but really the you know, Italian American heritage. I can imagine right now, you probably need to be mentally getting ready for your championship match. Yeah, this is a big, yeah, this is a big deal. So we have a wall of fame over there of all the champions. I haven't been on there yet. So 12 we'll years, and this uh, might be yes. the time. So this, this might be it. <laughs> so if somebody wants to get in touch with the club, where do they go? We have a Facebook page, you know, search Bocce New Orleans, you're gonna find us. So what we do is we post all of our events, all of our leagues, our open nights. Uh, most Thursdays when we're open, it's $5 for anyone to come to play Bocce. Well, TJ, I wanna thank you for being on the show, and I wanna hope you hit that Polino every ball that you throw this this match. All right, I'm getting up. on that wall of fame, I'm telling you, Charles. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Ciao. My name is Charles Gino Marsala. I am the president of the Italian American Federation of the Southeast, and I want to invite you to our Louisiana Italian Food, Wine, Film, and Author Festival. The Federation was started 50 years ago in 1973 to be an umbrella organization for all the Italian clubs throughout the South. Nationally, there's so much going on, it's very exciting to see what's available, whether it's getting young Italians involved with scholarships to Italy, or forming a future leaders conference, or forming new clubs now, we have the ability nationwide to mentor and give templates to any club throughout the South. And we have our Louisiana Italian Food, Wine, Film, and Author Festival coming up. I look forward to seeing you at the festival. For more information, visit our website, a-I-F-E-D-S-E dot org. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're here today in Metairie, Louisiana, Andrea's, and I'm with Lisa Ingram, who's the president of the Elanians. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. So Lisa, I understand the organization got started in the 1930s. The Elanians got started in Little Palermo, down in the French Quarter where all those girls lived. They were getting together and they just wanted to have a formal group. It was a carnival group, but they did not parade. They were named for Queen Elena. It is a fantastic organization of four generations and we are now 88 years of membership. I think your biggest thing is your Christmas ball. The Christmas ball is a Christmas dance or a ballo di Natale. It is honoring our 16 to 23 year old granddaughters, nieces, daughters of our members. Well, I gotta say, in 1980, 
I was actually one of the escorts. Oh, neat. So I'm very much a fan of the Elanians. That was many years ago. So tell me, you guys do a lot. I saw your scrapbook. We have four meetings a year, some demos of cooking. You're making cookies for Christmas. Italian child looks forward to Italian Christmas cookies. That's right. We love to try and bring back those nice arts that the Elanians do in their baking and bring that back to those who might not have gotten those tricks of the trade from their grandparents or mothers. And there's the day at the races because of course we are a philanthropic group so we do some fundraising efforts we do a fashion show in the fall and then we do St. Joseph then we do main crowning so we just kind of enjoy all those traditional events that the Elanians have enjoyed Now you guys were actually featured in Mardi Gras magazine this year. They wanted to write more about those carnival clubs that really don't parade. And so it was a fantastic spread in the Mardi Gras Guide. You guys took the lead on a new event called St. Joseph's Jazz. So it was really welcome to have a place to enjoy coming together and creating the St. Joseph altar. But there was a lot going on that day. The yes. bands many altars by the Marching Club. Viva San Giuseppe. It was an incredible location. We just felt like we had to be a part of the altar. So it was a fantastic event. Collaboration come together for the Italians. The outdoor music was beautiful. Right outside in the open air were the Asunto Dukes of Dixieland Jazz. They were all dressed out in their red pinstripe and white jackets. We love to listen to them. They were. I mean, it's kind of neat that they had this Italian six generations performing. The singer, Lexi. She was fantastic. She had such spirit. I just loved her. We're here today in Metairie, Louisiana, and we're at Moe's Chalet, and I'm with Lexi Asanto, it was one of the best performers I've heard. Lexi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I see you seem like you're having a lot of fun performing and being the fifth generation of your family's band. I am, it's great. It's always a fun time up there and people love to see us keeping the legacy and the tradition alive. You played at the St. Joseph Jazz Festival at Homeless House. Homeless House was great. It was a beautiful day. We had a nice turnout. I had my family there and my daughter as well. The amphitheater is beautiful. They have the gardens out there below the stage, and then they had the memorial altar for St. Joseph Day set up. They had a bunch of people out enjoying the music. Now, you have a great voice. Did you know you had a voice from your family? Um, I was always singing as a child. I grew up in my Aunt Betty's house, the Duchess of Dixieland, and she was always singing jazz and teaching me how to harmonize and do melodies with her and just family reunions, things like that. But I was always a little, <laughs> I was always a little shy to get up on the stage. So it's been a nice little change of pace. I grew up with my Uncle Dino showing me all of these videos of my family performing and the coats and all the, you know, everybody dancing and my Aunt Betty. How does this come to be? So the story I hear is actually kind of funny. My Uncle Dino and our tuba player, Jim, were speaking about starting this tribute band. And they were going through some family members. I guess they were looking on for vocalists online. And somehow my profile picture came up. And Jim asked my uncle, he said, this is your niece? I mean, are you related to her? He's like, yeah, that's my niece. Does she sing? She used to when she was a kid. And so they gave me a call and asked if I wanted to come try out because he wasn't sure if you know, singing when I was nine or 10 in front of him was still gonna be great at 30. So. It's kind of great work with the family still too, huh? Yeah, it's great. My uncle Dino is wonderful. He's always kept the legacy alive for us and my siblings and we've always known the history and have grown to appreciate it. So it's really wonderful being full circle and being able to keep it alive. 
Do you imagine one day doing a duet with your daughter? Well, she has actually come on stage a couple of times. And I mean, we do duets every day in the car. And um, <laughs> so she's a little shy though, like me. So maybe, maybe in the future, I don't know. <laughs> Now, if somebody wants to know more, is there a website? Yeah, so it's asuntodukestribute.com. Lexi, I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. So if somebody wants to know more, do you have a website or Facebook page? We do have a Facebook page. Well, Lisa, I want to thank you for being on the show. And I want to thank you for all the energy the Elanians bring to the Italian community of New Orleans and Louisiana. You guys are just a fabulous asset to the Italian Federation, to everything that's going on. And with that, I want to propose a toast. Salute. <laughs> Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Celebrating Cultures organize the content from our show into an app called New Orleans Insider Tours. Download the app to see views of the New Orleans skyline from various rooftop bars around the city. Go up to Rosie's on the Roof. It gives you a great perspective of the city. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We hope you've enjoyed this episode on the numerous festivals that are put on by Italian organizations. Complementing that are the activities of the societies, and those societies function all year round with many other smaller activities. It's a great way to transition the culture and heritage to future generations. If you'd like to find out more about a specific organization, please contact us. And also, there's a big debate about hot or cold. Um, all I can tell you is you don't want to get in the middle of one of those fights. That's all I can tell you. I mean, I literally almost had, we were going on the news one day before the Muffalata Vessel, and the debate the came up in the hallway outside. I almost had to break two guys apart, man. About which way to eat a Muffalata, yeah. out of cold? Oh, man, the colds are like, they're just, you don't, you don't insult them I like by suggesting them hot. it hot. I can tell you this, you know what it means if you're eating a Muffalata for breakfast? Mm. It means you're hungover. <laughs> but, uh, and it's just the E-L-E-N-I-A-N-C-U-L-U-B. -E I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> I want you to know that I'm wearing a pen here, and my pen is Rosie the Riveteer, and it says we can do it. And Rosie the Riveteer is an Italian lady who got a letter from her fiance who was overseas and said we need more airplanes over here during World War II. And her and her partner knocked out 4,000 rivets in a day. She was so motivated that we can get this done. They heard about what she was doing. She became the model for Rosie the Riveteer. And I have that Rosie the Riveteer uh, poster in my girl's room. 